our reading for today is the last one in the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a faithful brother, uh, a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that's happening here. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning, everyone. If you don't know who I am, my name's uh, Reverend Jenny Robinson, and I'm the curate here at St. James and at Holy Trinity. It's good to gather this morning. So before we start, let us pray. Lord, may our reading of your word, our thinking and our discussions this morning, help us to grow in your love and encourage us in our faith. Amen. So this morning we're finishing our series on the letter to the Colossians. We've spent the last five weeks reflecting on our confidence in Jesus. We've talked about that he is our Lord. We've talked about that he is our rock, that our fullness of life is found in him and that this reflects how we live in the world. And today we recap and summarize as we reflect our ministry of love to each other that is found in Jesus's ministry to us. So to summarize what we've covered so far, the opening chapter of Colossians focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. If you can remember that Messiah poem that we looked at, followed by Paul's description of his suffering in prison for the Messiah. And then Paul addresses the pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. In chapters three and four, Paul explores the new way of life that Jesus's resurrection has opened up for them. The theologian Maynall sums up the letter as follows. We can be confident in Jesus because of who he is, the full image of God, what he has done, dying to reconcile a rebellious world to God because Jesus is fully God and his victory is total. It is foolish and useless to move on from him. Instead, we should grow stronger in our love for him and obedience to him. That's a good summary. Now in today's passage, we look at how Jesus can be sort of our ministry. Now what does that mean? Well, the word ministry means to serve God in a particular way. And for all of us, this means something completely different. 
but it also means that we all do something similar. So we're all meant to encourage and point people to Jesus, telling them about what he has done for us and that he's the answer. But of course, we're all so different, this will look different in everybody's lives. For me and other priests, that means working in the church, leading services, preaching, ministering. But for most people, it means living out your faith in your workplace whether that's the schools, the arts, the NHS, business, hospitality, financial sector, charities. It'll all be different, but we are all called to be good neighbors and to serve our community. Our lives should be a reflection of Jesus and his ministry to us. He first loved us so that we could love others. So in short, we are to encourage one another. And our passage today starts with a section on prayer. The most important part of our Christian faith should be prayer. In all his letters, Paul is always urging the act and privilege of prayer to his friends. And it is a privilege. But how many of us think of prayer as a privilege? Do we think of it in that way? Do we wake each morning excited because we're going to have a conversation with God today? appreciating the peace and freedom that a relationship with God brings in our stressful world. Our relationship with Jesus is everything. So daily conversation in prayer with him should be foremost in our minds. But let's be honest, there are times in our lives when prayer feels really hard. But the answer is to never stop praying because spiritual dryness can never last. And if you're finding prayer hard, perhaps make use of sets of prayers to give you words you can't find. For example, morning and evening prayer in the church liturgy can be really helpful in times when you've just got no words yourselves. Those time-honored prayers can speak for us in difficult periods of our lives. Paul also tells his friends to be vigilant. In the Greek, the literal translation is wakeful. That doesn't mean we're not to sleep, but that we should be mindfully alert to the spirit, prompting us to pray. And if we can only manage those small utterances of sentences when we have nothing else, that's okay. These are beautiful to God because it's always about the desire and state of our heart. It's never about a dutiful act. Now in verse three, he says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Paul asks for prayer for him to have strength for the task ahead. He doesn't ask to be released from the task. That's really important to reflect on in our own situations. How many times do we pray for a situation to go away rather than the strength to get through it? Sometimes, and not always, it is going through the hard things that enables us to grow. We can't be immune from suffering in this world, but God will always give us the strength to face it when we trust and call on him. The well-known monk Thomas Keating wrote this in his book, Reflections on the Unknowable. He said, powerlessness is our greatest treasure. Don't try to get rid of it. Everything in us wants to get rid of it. Grace is sufficient for you, but not something you can understand. To be in too big a hurry to get over our difficulties is a mistake because you don't know how valuable they are from God's perspective. For without them, you might never be transformed as deeply and as thoroughly. So let us all be praying for God's strength and the grace to face all that life brings us. Paul then goes on to comment about how we should be in the world. Verses five and six say, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. He's asking us to act with wisdom and that our lives should be a form of mission and ministry. 
But only with wisdom will we know when and how to seize those opportunities to speak of Jesus when they arise. People never find Jesus because they've been argued into the kingdom, but because someone has demonstrated through their life loving service and wisdom. Paul also comments about being full of grace. One translation I looked up called it having charm. Well, I'm not sure that's the right connotation for today, but I read this as a mix of demonstrating joy, hopefulness and gentleness in our outlook. The worst advert is a grumpy Christian. We should proclaim all that Jesus has done for us with joy and gentleness. And then he says our conversation should be seasoned with salt. That means our conversations with, the, with others should have meaning. They shouldn't be shallow. We should have the courage to confront the wrong things that are in front of us and stand up for good so that our lives are a blessing to others and a place that they know is safe conversation, places of honesty and meaning. And the next few verses, verses seven to 15, are a set of names of Paul's faithful companions and heroes of the faith. We must remember that Paul was in prison and awaiting trial, and so it was really dangerous to be a friend of a prisoner. It took courage to visit Paul in prison. He lists the names of Tychemus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, that's the gospel writer of Mark, Jesus, who was called Justice, Epaphras, Luke, as in the gospel of Luke, and Demas. These friends have been great comfort to him. And that is how we should be to each other when we face trials. Paul calls us to stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ through adversity. Can we reflect on how we are with others when they're struggling and how others are with us in our trials? Who stands out to you in your experiences? Who are your faithful friends? And have we been that to others? Then in verse 16, Paul gives the instruction to read this letter to the church in Laodicea and that a letter is on its way from Laodicea to them. So what was this letter? Well, theologians give several possibilities. It could have been a specific letter to the church in Laodicea that has been lost. It may have been a letter we know as Ephesians, but theologians believe that the letter called Ephesians was probably actually not written to the church at Ephesus, but a letter that was actually meant to circulate all the churches in Asia. It may also have been the letter Philemon. So we're not quite sure, but that's okay. And then Paul closes the letter in verses 17 and 18 with a blessing. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains, grace be with you. Paul reminds us that he is in chains, but this reference is not a plea for sympathy. They are his chains of authority that guarantee of his right to speak because he has suffered for Christ. And so the letter comes to its end, like every one of Paul's letters, with grace. He always, send, he always ends by reminding us of the grace in Jesus that he has found sufficient for all things, and that's available to us all. So although this section of Colossians only appears to be a few verses about prayer and a lot about greetings, we can learn from it that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection transforms communities. And we need to work together as communities, as teams, to share the gospel and bring Christ's peace to the world around us. We must remember that praying is everything and that our church community should encourage one another through tough times. And so now I'm going to ask you to participate in an activity. And there are three choices, so there's something for everybody. Now, Paul was a letter writer, and he wrote at least 13 letters that we have in our Bible. He wrote to encourage and build us up, build up the church, encourage his brothers and sisters. And so I want you to imagine that you have to write a letter to a sister church to encourage them in their faith. What would you say? 
Now, for those of you who've been in the St. James's congregation since before COVID, you will know that Reverend Laura was asked to take on another church, Holy Trinity, now considered our sister church. Now, there's actually a great history between Holy Trinity and St. James's because Holy Trinity was established in 1868 and it grew and it planted another church, this one, St. James's in 1911. Ironically, in 1911, it was the curate of Holy Trinity that became the vicar at St. James's. And it now seems in 2025, the reverse will happen. And it's lovely to see this original relationship of these churches has now been restored. And so one option is to write a letter to Holy Trinity Church to encourage them at this time of new beginnings. For those of you who choose this, we would love to collect them in so that we can read them together at Holy Trinity. Now, if you don't know Holy Trinity and you're new to St. James, this necessarily won't have much meaning for you, and that's okay. So, so free, feel free to write a letter to another church, perhaps one in a persecuted country or one on your heart. The sheets you have on your chairs have a very structured outline for you, so it, it is made straightforward. It's following Paul's typical pattern of letters. But if you don't wish to do any of that, that's absolutely fine. If you look on the back of the sheet, there are seven prayer points on the sheet, and you can just spend time either praying on your own or with others for people you know. And these points are based on chapter one of Colossians, verses nine to 14. So I'm now gonna ask you to gather in groups of three or four with one sheet between you. There are more sheets at the back if for any reason you haven't got one. And we're gonna give you about 10 minutes to have that conversation and to think about how you can encourage another church.
going to ask that we gently come back. Uh, I thank you for, for doing this task, and if you've done it for Holy Trinity, then do please hand it in to Ed and Sue at the back on your, on your way out, and they'll collect them up. I appreciate you might not have finished it, and that's, that's fine too. If you want to take it home and finish it, please do. Don't feel you have to hand it in. If you want to keep working on it, that's absolutely fine. But I hope that the exercise has been thought-provoking and that you might consider how you can continue to encourage each other in our journey of faith. Colossians reminds us that through the cross, Christ has done everything we need to be reconciled to God. And Paul encourages us that our lifestyle should reflect the victory Christ has won for us. So let's enjoy each other's fellowship and pray without ceasing. Let's just finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go into the week ahead, that we would reflect on the, less, the lessons we've learned from the letter to Colossians, that we would remember to encourage each other and to prioritize our prayer time with you. Amen. <laughs>